Uh, okay, so just by way of intro, this is a talk I gave in January for a different audience in Hobart, the Linux Australia conference, where there was a lot of developers in the audience, so it had a slightly different kind of um, slant to it, and I wasn't really worried about people screaming corrections from the audience, but given this one is about government, things that kind of happened here, I'm expecting more people to shout corrections as I go, so feel free to either do that as we go at the end. Either way is fine. So um, let me just kind of kick off with a bit of an, an intro. So um, my name is Gavin Tapp. Um, I live in Canberra. I've lived here for about 12 years now, I think. Um, I joined Acra about two and a half years ago, actually following DrupalGov in 2015, I think. That was where I kind of um, got more immersed in the world of Drupal and ended up meeting people from Acra and studying on this path. Um, I've been a national organiser for GovHack for six plus years, I think. So um, one of the reasons I want to give this talk is that it kind of talks about the things I'm interested in, which are open data and government transparency and how they've kind of been woven through some of the work we've been able to do, which has been really good. Um, I'm a web nerd, and then I've been working on websites for far too long. Uh, I've been a public servant in the ACT and federal, federal governments at different points. And uh, I ran the websites for Lifeline for about six years. So got to spend a lot of time working out how to do things with like no money, which was a great way to kind of learn lots of different skills. It was really good. Um, just quickly about uh, Acquia. Um, some of you may have heard of Acquia. So um, uh, we provide cloud-based Drupal products, which is prominently uh, uh, hosting for Drupal sites. Uh, we help organizations use these capabilities to offer their products and services and interact with their customers. Uh, Acquia was co-founded by Dries Beitart, who's also the project lead for the Drupal project, so he kind of was the originator of it. Oh, that, can you hear that feedback, or is it just me? Could I speak up? I can, I'm just worried about the mic feeding back, but is that better if I... Maybe I just need to get a lot closer and then it won't feed back. I just can't read my notes. Okay, um, uh, so Acquia has very strong ties with the open source community as a result of that, and we're headquartered in Boston with offices around the world. Um, we are also the service provider to Department of Finance. Uh, the government service that they uh, offer to agencies is hosted on Acquia's uh, platform. Um, I'm not here to say you anything, except maybe GovCMS, which is pretty awesome. Uh, also, I'm not showing anything in relation to information that's kind of sensitive to clients. It's all kind of public domain stuff and largely kind of historical. Uh, and what I do, uh, I work on Drupal web projects. I'm not, I don't claim to be a technical person anymore. I'm more in the space of kind of working out plans to help clients do what they want to do with their website. So uh, discoveries and timetables and budgets and contracts, that kind of thing. Um, and I help, uh, I work with clients to help them understand what they need to do and to get there in the best way possible. Uh, a few parts to this talk. If you're wondering why I'm rushing it, because when I gave this talk in January, it took a full 40 minutes, which wasn't very good because there was no time for discussion and all those corrections that I want. So if I feel like I'm rushing, it's because I'm trying to go a bit faster. Uh, there's a few parts to this talk. So the first part is kind of largely um, history around the things that happened before GovCMS, which might be really familiar to some people here, but for others could be strange territory that you don't know about. Of course, we don't care about. Um, the latter part is some cool things we've done with GovCMS more recently, um, which are now kind of you know demonstrating a lot of those open source principles and open data principles that have become available to uh, all members of the GovCMS community. Um, so I would normally talk a bit about what uh, GovCMS is. I'm probably going to skip over that a little bit today. Uh, I'll talk about how it emerged uh, from open data and used open source. Uh, the the process that finance went through, about how they evaluated different solutions, um, how you take care of an open source project, uh, how open data and GovCMS work together, and then give two examples of recent projects where we've kind of demonstrated these things. And then hopefully, ideally, you have questions at the end. Can you still hear me okay? Am I drifting away? All right, okay. All right, so what is GovCMS? Now, I have a note here to skip this one because I'm gonna assume most people have some idea about this. Is that fair or should I give a quick version of it? Quick version, okay. Um, GovCMS is a program run by Department of Finance. It includes a version of Drupal, which is also called GovCMS. There are other parts of the GovCMS program, including 
the hosting the Department of Finance provide, um, the advice and engagement you can get from the Department of Finance and other people about how to use Drupal to solve things, um, and the community that they're building around use of Drupal within government, or broadly things I would say fall under that GovCMS umbrella. Um, I'll talk a bit more about how we kind of got there, and that might give you a more complete answer about what GovCMS is, but happy to come back to that if we need to. Let's commence the history. So let's talk a bit about how GovCMS got to this point, because it builds on important work that's been done over probably a, a decade or more in this space. Um, so since we're in Canberra today, probably people here that are actually involved in working on these things and making the decisions, so I'm really happy to get their input. Um, I may give this talk again, and I may give it in other kind of contexts where people don't uh, have the kind of um, knowledge about how this stuff kind of gets done, so I'm quite happy to kind of improve this talk each time I give it, so if you have input, please let me know. Um, does anyone remember the Gov2 task force? Anyone here kind of around or involved in government when that was a thing? A few people. So um, in 2009, the Gov2.0 Gov task force was kicked off by the Rudd government. It was active for only a very short space of time, but it had quite a big impact for the, the length of time it ran for. One of its main outputs was a report that um, had a set of recommendations, including that Gov should encourage the release of open data across the Australian government and use more open licensing. And open source, as you read through the report, is a really central theme. And not just that you know we should have better licenses that are conducive to open source, but they said we should look at the way open source projects are run and borrow those methods and use them in government. So we should be open and transparent about the things we are producing. We should encourage more people to review what we are doing and contribute to it and sort of leverage that broader pool of people beyond who we can just engage with in our staff or pay from our own budgets. Um, Oops, I might have missed a bit. Uh, one of the uh, activities that they kicked off in that period was the first Gov hack as well, which I was a participant in. I kind of stumbled across it and went in. I've never really stumbled out again since then. So the aim of Gov hack, if you're not familiar with it, uh, is to take data sets published by government and do unexpected things with them. So in the first year, everything was about putting things on the map. So I think my entry was taking a data set of the location of public toilets and putting it on Google Map. Like, yeah, this is great. No one ever done this before. Groundbreaking stuff. Everyone has immediately done that since. Um, but it kind of put a stake in the sand about how do we get this stuff out there so more people can do it. Um, now, the first one was organised by John Allsop and a few other people. You may know that name from Web Directions and other things. He's kind of a prominent player in the web sphere in Australia. One of the things that flew out, flew out of that was a greater commitment to open data and where these things would be hosted. So we had data.gov.au, which was launched in 2010, also runs on open source CCAN software. That's now home to 23,000 data sets uh, from many government agencies, both state and federal. Uh, some state governments also run their own data repositories, whether these in CCAN or Socrata or something else. And while interesting, Gov 2.0 has ebbed and flowed a little bit with the political cycle, there's generally broad support for it across the spectrum um, because you may be interested in some of the economic benefits that come out of publishing this data. There's quite a lot of study done in that area. Uh, or you may be interested in the transparency that comes out of publishing open data. Uh, one of the other recommendations from the Gov2 task force was a, to encourage a greater participation in public discourse by public servants, uh, both by social media and official blogs from agencies and other things like this. Um, this example here is a comment posted by John Sheridan, probably on the Department of Finance or Agimo blog back in the day. Um, he became a frequent commenter on a number of blogs and was regularly chipping in to set the record straight where discussion may not may have been underway without all the facts on something. Um, so I think that's probably eased off a little bit in the last couple of years. We don't quite see the same eagerness from public servants to try out that means of communication, but it was certainly a big area of focus uh, around this time. Uh, the other thing that the Gov2 task force did was kick off the first uh, open data mashup contest, where they actually gave out prizes for people who did these cool things, like put public toilets on maps and do other kind of cool stuff like that. That was not that cool. There were some cooler ones that people worked on. Um, now, the interesting thing about this site is that the Department of Finance needed somewhere to host 
these sites that they were producing. So to be consistent with their recommendations, uh, they wanted to host it in a place that was open source. And from this, GovSpace emerged. So GovSpace was a WordPress multi-site system hosted by Department of Finance, and it was set up to be compliant with the government's security requirements, and was also made available to other government agencies who were looking to get on board with the task force's recommendations. And one of the key uses at this point was for blogging, with the goal that more government agencies would establish blogs, provide more frequent, less formal updates on topics of interest and work in their departments. And these blog posts will be open to comments and greater civic dialogue would occur. So with these mostly blogging goals in mind, uh, WordPress was a fine choice of content management system, so that's what they went with. Uh, it was tweaked to the extent needed to comply with security, a small set of plugins were added, and set up on dedicated servers. Uh, at launch, um, I think it was at no cost to agencies. They could come onto this and have a WordPress site for, for no cost to the agency. Uh, that changed over the next year or two, and I think it went as high as 5,000 per year to host a site on GovSpace. It might have been more than that by the end. Sorry? 2,500 per site. 2,500 per site. Oh, okay. Maybe 5,000 was what they told me, but it was more expensive for me. That makes sense. Um, either way, it was a bargain for hosting government websites. Like, for the level of service that you're going to get, the fact that it was security accredited and you didn't need to get your internal IT team to do an IRAP assessment or any of that kind of stuff, amazingly cheaper. Um, so I think at its peak it had perhaps 30 to 40 websites. There might have been more behind the scenes that weren't live, but it had a reasonable amount of success. For the most part, a lot of these sites are quite small, like uh, working groups between agencies or COAG kind of initiatives, that kind of thing. Um, there were a couple of larger sites. So um, this is one that I worked on. There was also the Defence Minister's website. Um, so some people took the starting out of the box themes and just kind of ran with those. Other people invested in custom WordPress themes, which is what this is. Um, GovSpace closed down in December last year. Right. Well, it serves as well, and I think um, what this really sets the scene for is what finance decided to do next and the things they learned from this. So, um, moving from GovSpace to GovCMS. So, it's important to note here that while Acquia um, works a lot with Department of Finance, I'm not speaking for them here, so, um, uh, yeah, I would like to kind of at some point fact check some of this with you and, and them to make sure this is all okay, but this is kind of my take on the creation of GovCMS. So, uh, buoyed by the success of GovSpace, the team of Department of Finance took the lessons they had learned, planned the next iteration. So, the aim here wasn't just to set up a shared service, but to re-platform australia.gov.au to any content management system, and to do this, Finance had some clear ideas about what they wanted. So, they wanted to continue with the open source ethos that had of the challenges that I have with GovSpace, I think open space wasn't one of them. And they were very keen to kind of stick with the same uh, recommendations and thinking that came out of the Gov2 task force and other work that had been done across the government about the benefits of open source. They wanted something that was more scalable. They wanted something with um, deeper enterprise capabilities and configuration options. They wanted a broader pool of vendors that could, they could work with to build out sites. Uh, and um, yeah, just a broader ecosystem of other people that contribute to the system. Um, so look, open source was contested at the time. If you go back and read through the comments on forums at the time, you'll see there's some pretty heated debate from people that weren't in the open source business, that they really challenged that. And they challenged it for some interesting government kind of reasons, like how can you go to market and say, you know what you want? You should go to market and say, you know, here are the things I'm hoping to achieve. Now you, market, tell me how you can best meet that. But finance took a different direction here and actually went, actually, you know what, we want Drupal. We've done some assessment, we've done some measurements, Drupal's the one we want. The report they wrote, which you can access on their website now, is their CMS review report. So this came out in uh, June 2012 and focused on a comparison of the top three open source options that they looked at. So they were comparing not just features, but also frequency of updates, history of security patches, the number of vendors providing services, and also the general size of the contributing community. And they shortlisted down to three 
So Drupal, Magnolia, and Liferay. Drupal's ranked third for features, but when the size of the vendor pool and the global community was considered, it was enough to balance that out and become the option that they chose. So with Australia.gov.au sort of one side as a separate project, one of the goals here for finance was to design a program that also built capacity in agencies and the vendor marketplace, with the intention to kind of nudge the vendor marketplace towards providing Drupal services. Similarly, there's a desire to build skills and capability uh, within the public service, and it's hoped that GovCMS will help with this, as skills gained working on one site in one agency, one project, can be transferred to other agencies and other projects. So you can kind of spread out and uh, grow the knowledge, uh, the pool of people with knowledge of how to work on these systems. Uh, and while it's true of any system or any software that you can have that kind of growth of knowledge, because there's no license being involved in running up Drupal sites, there's less friction involved in actually growing the number of sites there and hopefully growing that pool of people who work on them. Okay, so Finance ran an open tender for Drupal hosting services, which Aquila was fortunate to win. It was in October 2014. Uh, GovCMS now hosts more than 123 websites. Could be even more than that, actually. Um, these are both on software as a service and platform as a service options, which is slightly different. Um, the software as a service option, or SaaS, runs the standard GovCMS distribution, comes with a CDN, uh, WAF, and is RF assessed up to the application level. It doesn't suit every project. Um, for example, it doesn't allow sites with classified content uh, or lots of trans transactional content, but for the majority of government websites around today, it would meet their needs. Another key secret to success here, which I, I don't think is very well understood, is that GovCMS is not mandatory, and anyone can take it for use. Um, I was at some events last week where Sharon reiterated to the audience there that she thinks one of the secrets of their success is that it hasn't been mandatory, that as soon as you try and force it on agencies, they find reasons to not take it. Whereas if you can just be successful and prove that it can do different things, you start to attract people that can see how they can apply it to their own circumstances. Um, if you don't want to host with Department of Finance on their service, you can host it elsewhere. If you're a developer or a digital agency with government, up to government clients, you can build sites on GovCMS and then use hosting from Department of Finance. You use in-house hosting at the client or host it on your own uh, systems. And one thing that excites me here is that we're starting to see digital agencies submit bids for work at state and federal level with GovCMS as part of the solution. Uh, and that they think they'll win business with this, which is fantastic. And where many of these companies might have included proprietary software in those bids in the past, they now use open source as part of their pitch. So Department of Finance is kind of set up the boundaries, they put their soccer ball on the field, they're letting other people kind of kick it around. And even if you don't come onto their platform, just by using their tools and growing the user base of GovCMS or Drupal, you're kind of helping them meet their objectives. So right now, it does look like this is a pretty successful open source uh, project in government. It's got a way to go and it's still growing. Um, but I like to think we can kind of point to this burst of activity in open government as one of the origin points for its creation. And as more sites are added, and more people gain the skills to set up and operate GovCMS sites, we're likely to see it to grow, which is great. Uh, so let me tell you a little bit about how GovCMS works as an open source project. Some of this will be familiar, but for people new to open source, this hopefully will be interesting and important stuff to know. Um, so I'm gonna assume there's a mix of some developer type people in the room here and some non-developer type people. And then that the non-developer type people may not have had much familiarity with contributing to an open source project. So I hope that's okay. Um, this is GitHub. So GitHub is one of the tools we use to manage changes to code. Um, Department of Finance uh, own an open source project called GovCMS, which is available on GitHub and also on Drupal.org. So you can download the Drupal distribution, the GovCMS Drupal distribution from here and install it on your own hardware and have the same thing you would have if you were hosted on Department of Finance's systems. Um, if you find something that's broken with it, you can, and you have the right skills or someone in your team has the right skills, you can write a change to the code and then push that back and submit that as a, uh, a change to the, uh, the code base 
Department of Finance can review that and then accept it back in. And then, hey, you've improved this thing that's shared by lots of people. That's how open source works, is that you can do that kind of thing. Um, so there are also other repositories in this GitHub project, such as uh, de design themes. So if you've seen the Department of Communications website, their theme is here. So if you had a, uh, a project for your agency and you want to use that as a starting point, the code is there. So you can take it and then adapt it and apply it to your site. There are other themes there as well. So they're kind of building this pool of assets that are available for all government agencies to use. Even you don't even need to be a government agency, you can just take this stuff, it's available for anyone to take it. Um, so the GovCMS project, uh, Drupal Distro, is based on a fork of another Drupal project called AGov. So Finance created their own projects so that they could control it in the way they needed. Um, the term fork might be a bit new to some of you here, so if you take a thing that's open source and you clone it, and then you change it and kind of run with that version from there, that process is called forking something. So if you wanted to use the Department of Communications theme, you could clone it and then change it from there. And that will be creating your own fork of that theme. Um, so the, to cover this, so yeah, GovCMS is currently version 2.10 and this release is coming out about monthly, maybe four to six weeks, new releases come out. So far, most of those code contributions have come from a fairly small pool of people who are working on GovCMS, um, but that number is growing all the time and we'd really like to see it get higher. Um, as I mentioned, code contributions move through a workflow before being accepted. They each need to be tested, uh, which the community can, can help with, uh, and they need to be considered by the GovCMS project owners for relevance, priority, security, and other issues, other factors. And once they're through that process, they get merged into GovCMS and included in the next release in that four to six week cycle. Um, you may know that there are thousands of Drupal modules available in the community that could be added to a distribution like this. GovCMS comes with a set of modules out of the box. And while new ones can be added, the goal is to do it only when there's a really strong reason to do that. Uh, and the aim is to avoid adding kind of maintenance overhead to the distribution as a whole. Because everything that goes in there, when you do subsequent releases, you have more things to test and more things to potentially go wrong. So there's a little bit of a, a threshold there. Things need to get passed before they'll be included. Um, so if you want to add a module via GitHub, you can submit a pull request with the details of what you'd like added in. And in that situation, the module will be assessed against the same criteria as other code contributions. Uh, as long as the Department of Finance look at how well it's maintained, uh, how good the quality of the code is, um, whether there's any securities that it might bring with it, and that kind of thing. Um, normally, if Department of Finance say no, that they don't think adding that module is the right thing to do, it's because GovCMS already has a way to meet that particular function, uh, or because the module is, in some cases, it might be specific to a paid service. So if there's a Drupal module for a system like MailChimp, for example, they may say they would prefer to see a module added that worked for MailChimp, Campaign Monitor, and Vision 6. They might want a more generic type module because it will allow more use cases down the track. Uh, open data and GovCMS. How many open time? I want you to finish ads. Okay, I'm going to continue going quickly. I know this is probably too quick, but I do want to have time for questions at the end. So. Um, so the data.gov.au team and the GovCMS team have quite strong links, so um, for a long time they were part of the same branch in Department of Finance, so they share a really similar kind of ethos in how they run. Um, and where we can, we encourage agencies that are moving sites to GovCMS to think about if there's data on their site, they could also go into data.gov.au at the same time. Um, most agencies are already aware of data.gov.au, but some aren't, and there are quite a few that are aware of it, but not sure how to get from A to B to take the data and actually put it into data.gov.au and then to pull it out and use it on a website. Um, so we're able to help with that kind of um, process. Um, sometimes the best we can do is put them in touch with the data.gov.au team and help them kind of answer questions about data governance and management and how that system can be used. Um, Happily, sometimes we get to do more than that. So this is a little bit of a story of one of those examples. So um, I would call this a tale of two projects. So uh, it's an example where we could do a little bit more. And the two projects are the 
Department of Energy Environment and State of the Environment report. Um, hello, Simon. How are you going? Simon was one of the uh, team from Department of Environment who worked on that at the uh, agency side. And the other project I wanted to touch on quickly is the uh, Premier and Cabinet side from Victoria for their budget papers in 2016. Uh, so firstly, the Energy and Environment, State of the Environment report. This is the report from 2011. It's like a hardcover phone book. I think there's 900 plus pages in it. Um, and we started work with the Department of Environment choosing GovCMS for their State of the Environment project and also choosing to go down the path of adding data to data.gov.au. And they wanted a way to take that data and present it as graphs and visualizations on their site, which is fantastic. Later, the Department of Premier and Cabinet also chose to use GovCMS and wanted to use uh, again, interactive graphs on their sites. I'm like, oh, we think we know how you can do that. We've got this thing that's kind of underway. When do you want it? Oh, budget night. Hmm. Okay, it's not going to be ready by budget night. Okay, how do we do this? So we got a conversation started between the different parties that were kind of involved in, in doing this. So Department of Premier, or I guess Aqua, worked with Doghouse Media, some of whom are here today, um, who are doing the development on the State of the Environment website. Um, we were reaching a natural pause in that project where the agency was going to go work with their content authors. So what we did was kind of tidy up the module at that point, add it to GitHub and say, okay, it's kind of ready for someone else to pick up and run with it at this point. At that point, Premier and Cabinet engaged uh, Salsa Digital, who are also here. They picked up that module and went, okay, here's how we can apply that to this project. They made some changes to it and pushed those back to the repository. So after they'd finished launching their site, and Department of Environment picked up again to keep working. The module itself had made progress in that time um, in that kind of collaborative way of pushing changes to GitHub. Um, so through this process, uh, the GovCMS team provided some light oversight to make sure the module would be safe to deploy uh, and ready in production on the time that the budget site was launched. Uh, state budgets, like federal budgets, you don't want the content to go live until the treasurer is standing at the box giving the talk, so no pressure we had to come and launch this thing on time. It went really well, it was really good. Um, so State Environment came back from their resume break and there was, you know, they were able to kind of pick up and continue and sort of have that next step ahead from the work that Premier and Cabinet had done. So it's not often you see those examples where government agencies at the federal level are able to kind of collaborate in that kind of way. It's even rarer to see them happening between state and federal. So we basically had two agencies contribute you know, paid effort to something without needing to go through any kind of complicated MOUs between them about who's going to do which bit, how do we know they're going to do that bit, there's no mailing of checks or any of that kind of stuff. It all happens seamlessly via this open source approach to software development. Um, yeah, and I'll quickly show it to you. So, ta-da. Um, obviously, if you go to the I'll put these slides up later on. If you go to the URLs at the bottom here, you can actually mouse over this stuff and see those tables move across and sort of highlight the data. One of the key things I want to kind of draw your attention to, though, is the little strip at the bottom. So to ensure this is accessible, you can flick to Show Table and it'll show all the data available there. So it's not just a, a, a blob of images that can't be machine read. Uh, you can download this as a PNG if you need to include it into another document or report. And even better, if you're still working in InDesign or one of those print type workflows, you can download this as an SVG as well, so as a vector image, and drop it into your, into your docs. So pretty cool. Um, the State of the Environment report for 2011 looks like this. And the aim in producing the 2016 version was to allow you to kind of go, okay, let's just look at the data. Let's not completely change the format. So we were able to um, set up the module in such a way that you can present graphs in a similar style. It has the same buttons down at the bottom with the addition of a download data. When you click that, the little page at the side there is actually from data.gov.au. It will take you to data.gov.au and actually show you the data set. So if you're interested in this topic, you want to do your own number crunching or compare it with your own data set, it's really easy to grab that raw data and do your own work on it. Uh, note again, you can download an SVG here. One of the really cool stories out of this project that was that because the department still had to produce a printed hard copy version of this, or paper version, to table in Parliament because of the way the regs are written, 
they kind of flip the workflow. So we produce these graphs early on in the project. The document authors work in InDesign, downloaded the SVG files, dropped them into InDesign, produced the PDF. So this kind of provide a part of their workflow, which is kind of cool. We produce graphs using their website. They went into the paper version. Strange. Um, so this website launched on March 7, the State of the Environment website. Um, I'm pleased to say most of the media coverage, or all the media coverage, I think, was about the content of the report, doom and gloom. Nobody really talked about the technology of the website, but we will try and do that more over the next couple of months because it was a really uh, interesting project that the agency was really happy with. Uh, Simon's doing a talk today yep. on this, so if you're interested, make sure you check that out. It's a really good story. Um, um, credit to Jeremy, who's at the back there. He did a lot of work on the CCAN module here. I think um, there are probably many parents for this, but probably one of the main parents for the module itself would be, would be Jeremy. Um, he gave a talk with Megan and Stuart, one of the other ACWI guys at Triple South. I encourage you to go and look at it. Um, one of the bits of it is a... Is this playing? At the end of the talk, Jeremy says, OK, I'm going to show you how to do this. He has a local version of CCAM with a data set on his laptop, and he goes through and builds a graph in real time and shows how easy it is. This is that part of his talk sped up five times for the sake of this exercise. So he's not that quick, but he's pretty good. Um, so look, this is all pretty interesting, but the link I want to make here is that GovCMS, as an open source project, made collaboration on this capability much easier. Uh, and the link from this back to open data and open government is that it's going to make it easier to use open data in these sites in future. And there's a flywheel effect that applies to open data. So the more you use it, the more valuable it becomes. The more valuable it is, the more you want to provide. So um, in the same way that GovHack helps to spin that flywheel by having people do things with data and having agencies release data for a nominated event, um, this feature is now out of the box with GovCMS and moves us in that same direction as well. So if you're in an agency and you've got data that you think is interesting, even if it's only to your own staff, using GovCMS, you've now got this really easy mechanism to grab it and display it. Are you finished, Jeremy? I think you are. Okay. Uh, do go and watch that talk. It's really, it's really good. Um, okay, so I'm getting close to time. I'm going to go really quickly. I'm going to skip that one, actually. Um, so what does it mean? So a feature is now available for any Drupal site, including GovCMS sites. Um, you can contribute to the CK module on GitHub using that address. Any developer can work on this module and submit improvements to it. We've since done other projects with Department of Finance and other agencies and pushed this module even further. We've added new graph types and other kinds of things. It's been, it's been really good. Um, Department of Finance, as the owner for the module, will then review those things and include them in. And unless they're kind of... They'll give you constructive feedback if they say no, right? So there's a process here where this gets better over time. Um, who pays for this kind of work? As I said, paying for things, sharing payment for things between agencies is not an easy thing if you've tried that. Um, because they can contribute independently and pursue their own goals with something, they're able to kind of fit this into a procurement process. So they can say, um, we need to do two days' work, two weeks' work to improve this module so it meets our particular use case and they can fit that into a procurement process and run from there. They don't need to worry about whether Department of Finance is going to pay as well. They can just meet their own needs. The cost should be less than if they didn't collaborate, and cost should be greatly reduced for each agency that follows. If you're looking at GovCMS now, this is out of the box. It's free. You can just kind of do this stuff, which you couldn't do before. Um, can you try it out? Yes, you can. If you go to acquia.com, you can run up a free uh, Drupal instance, you can pick GovCMS from a box, answer some questions, and within about 10 minutes, you've got a fully functional GovCMS site. Um, the module is in there. It takes a little bit of box clicking to get it to work. There are instructions on how to do that at community.govcms.gov.au if you want to go and see that. And I, I wrote these, it actually says step one, click here, step two, click here, and it'll walk you through it. Big closing statement GovCMS is part of the open government and open data movement. That's it. And then some quick acknowledgements again to Jeremy for his work. Um, Stuart from Acquia, who worked on the probably first six months of the State of the Environment website, and was really instrumental in that phase. Um, Victoria, Department of Premier and Cabinet. Um, Department of Environment, particularly Megan Watson, who can't be here today because she's taking a well-deserved holiday, um, but she was a really key part of that project. And also the GovCMS team uh, and their work 
uh, supporting the inclusion of this new and expanded module in GovCMS. Thank you. And that's it. Thank you very much. I'm happy to take any questions if anyone has any.